Well, thank you, Dr. Cabrera, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure. So how did you come to apply for the position of uh, president of George Mason University? Well, I, we, we lived at the time in Arizona, and um, I, I was president of, uh, of Thunderbird, and, and our kids at the time were um, hitting high school age, and we thought, you know, this might be the right timing to consider a move so that we gave the kids some stability during high school. So I said, you know, we, we probably should be open if the, if the right opportunity came up. And I, I considered um, going into business, actually. And we, we had a, a very interesting opportunity in Miami, and we even considered it and traveled to Miami. And, and, and we were really thinking seriously about it when uh, quite literally the, the telephone rang. And mm -hmm. we were having dinner with friends, and we were telling them about this Miami job. And, and the, the friends were saying, well, you know, you don't sound all that excited about going to Miami. You seem like you're trying to convince yourself. And that's when I got the email. It says, hey, George Mason University is looking for a president. So I saw the email on my iPhone going to the, to the restroom, and on the way back, I told them, I got this email from George Mason University. My friends look at me and says, all of a sudden you look happy. Mm -hmm. What's, don't go to Miami. And so actually we declined the job in Miami before knowing whether this was going to work out. But, but uh, I was so uh, intrigued by it. And yeah, it was the, the headhunter called me and, and I had a couple of conversations with the board and decided to, to interview formally. And um, finally, here I am. So what was the interview process like? It was uh, uh, my first point of contact was with the two board members who led the search committee, um, Lovey Hamill mm -hmm. and Carol Kirby. And they said, hey, we're very intrigued by you. We're going to be in Texas. Um, can you meet? And so I told Beth, I said, I have to go to Texas. She said, well, I have all these complications with the kids. I, I'm sorry, I have to go to Texas. I need to. So I, we met at the airport. It's a top secret uh, sure. interview in a, in, a, in a hotel room. And there was real chemistry. I loved how they spoke about the university and the passion they showed about the university. I, I, was, I returned home. I said, that this might be the real thing. I really love what I'm, what I'm hearing. So that was the beginning. Then there was a formal process where I, I came to Alexandria. I forgot the name of the hotel on King Street where the, the, the search committee had gathered. And um, so it's a big, big search committee with representatives, some faculty members and board members, students, uh, members of the community, and a whole bunch of uh, questions. But I remember it not as a, as a stressful uh, conversation. I, I remember it as a quite a pleasant conversation with that group and, and really walking out of the room quite inspired by mm -hmm what I could read in the, in the questions and in the reactions of, of the members of the committee. And um, so why do you think you were selected? Or do you, just even in your own, I mean, what do you think impressed them? So? I, that's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> don't know. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, obviously, I, um, I think there were questions about, I remember there was a lot of interest in, in understanding my, my views about the future of higher education, mm -hmm. how technology was transforming um, higher education, what I thought about what was going on in, in, in various universities. So, so it, I think we engaged in conversations that were not just so much practical about what would you do if X, and more so about uh, vision related, if you will. So I'm, I'm guessing that there was something in, in, in my views of higher ed that resonated with them. Um, but I, I, re I really don't know, and, and these search processes are complicated. So uh, I'm sure there were like um, plenty of people with, with, with great qualifications, perhaps, perhaps even superior qualifications, uh, but there's gotta be uh, chemistry and there's gotta be a moment and, 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 a, and a sense that, that this is the person that this organization needs in this particular moment. And, um, hey, I'm glad they reached the conclusion yeah. they did because this has been an incredible experience. Yeah, and it seemed, you know, on the outside, over here, it seemed as if it took forever. Is that right? Yeah, because we, we remembered the last time around, some of us who had been here forever remembered Dr. Burton's 
uh, search process, and it was different. We we kind of had a we knew what was going on along all along because we knew we had four candidates. We got to meet the candidates, you know. But we were smaller then, you know. We weren't. It wasn't that that job wasn't what it is today or what it was seven mm -hmm. years ago. So the necessity for you know this is really a big time job now, um, you know that during Dr. Merton's tenure, you know, our status just went so much higher. Right. And we and did. in waiting for, for you, we had no idea what was going on. <laughs> right. And and like I said, it seemed like But it I, you know, I know when you're inside, uh, there's a sense of I mean you it's easy to be impatient or, or, mm -hmm. or have a sense of urgency. You want to know there's so much uncertainty. But from the outside, this was actually quite a fast process mm -hmm. in the overall scheme of things. I think they, they started off the process in the summer and I was announced in December. Yeah. I mean, there are some of these processes that take the, the, the better part of, a, of an academic year. So it wasn't that bad, actually. And I was there at uh -huh. the hotel. Right. <laughs> yeah, of course, you, you know better than, you can answer that question better than I can because <laughs> you were in the deliberations too. So what did you know about Mason before you applied, bef bef before you actually decided to read up on us? What, what did you know? Sure. A few years ago, I I was asked by President Clinton to uh, to co-chair the um, the Clinton Global Initiative annual meeting in New York, and there was a professor who was another co-chair, Phil Auerswald, who uh, teaches in the Shar School, and so one of my first the first people that I knew uh, was him, and I was quite impressed by by his background and and the impact that he was having in the in the bigger scenes, and, and so I was very intrigued by that. I, I think I heard Alan Merton speak on a couple of uh, higher education events, so I had also that, that perspective. And then, uh, of course, as um, I heard about the, the opportunity, all of a sudden, all these connections started popping up in my life, and, and professors and, and colleagues that I had had who either were here or have been here, and, and so you start accumulating information, and it was really fascinating, but what was, very uh, interesting is that a few years ago, before we even responded to the call and, and agreed to meet with the, with the search committee, uh, and we started thinking, hey, what would we do after, after Arizona? Uh, Beth, uh, my wife, uh, we were on a, one of our beach vacations in Spain, and she was going for a long walk and came back from one of her long walks and says, you know, I've decided that if we, whenever we're ready to move from Arizona, Northern Virginia would be the place for us. I talk about. I'm like, okay, how did you reach that conclusion? <laughs> We've never lived there. We really don't know many people there. I, I go to D.C. for business, but we don't. And she's, she had a whole theory of why that was the perfect place for the Cabreras. And then we kind of forgot about that conversation because it's like, well, what are the chances that I will find a job there? And sure enough, here we are. She uh -huh. saw something. She saw something in the future. So... Yeah, so what, what was most striking about Mason? Or did you already mention it? No, I mean, what, what I really pretty immediately pops up every time you talk to anyone who knows Mason, uh, well, there are a couple of ideas that they may come up in different words and in different ways, but it's always those two ideas. One is this um, notion of diversity and inclusion. Anybody who sets foot on this campus for the first time, it pops up. It, you, you, you see it. But even people who know this place, well, they recognize it as a strength. They're proud of it. They see it as one of a very unique aspect of this university. So that's one of the things that I, that I knew. The other one is this notion of innovation. Young university that was just a satellite of UVA until the 70s and all of a sudden explodes into this incredible institution. A university that had to find its way um, to really uh, go through obstacles that were planted in, along the way mm -hmm. to get to where it is. And, and that forced this university to always find an innovative pathway to get there, that it had to do things differently almost by necessity. So uh, again, it, those two ideas, diversity and innovation, they, they came in different flavors and in, through different stories, but they were always there. And sure enough, when I arrived, 
I recognized exactly those two concepts in, in this place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so no organization is turnkey. You don't just jump into some place and begin running it. So, so when you first got here in the summer of 2012, what changes in programming or infrastructure did you feel Mason needed to move on and to, to get even better? Well, I, I had uh, the luxury that the university was going very well. Um, after 18 years of George Johnson and 16 years of Alan Merton, this place had great momentum. You know, we, we were large and growing. The research activities um, were, were growing, the reputation of the university were going. So I did not arrive here in a situation of crisis, which is very nice yeah. because it gave me the chance of opening a cycle of strategic thinking, of visioning, of bringing the community together to talk about what should this place be like in a few years. Uh, and, and that was really, uh, is really exciting. Some members of the board, I think, were a little more impatient. They said, come on, you will just hire you. You must come with your plan and go. It's like, well, you know, it's very important that whatever we do has a broad uh, basis of support among our faculty and our staff and our students and our friends and so on. So what I dedicated the biggest part of the uh, first year, first is not to slow down the, that momentum to make sure that that continued, but we brought the whole community together through a whole number of events using appreciative inquiry and other techniques to really extract the mission, to write a mission statement, by the mm -hmm. way, which at, at the time no one even knew what the mission had, statement was. Yeah. There was one, but it was too long and complicated, no one really knew. So we needed a sharp mission statement. We needed a vision of what type of university we imagined in the future, and we needed clarity around the values and the things we believe in. So that was step number one. Brought it to the board with a great level of support. Board enthusiastically approved it. Went back to the working table to try to translate that into a strategic plan. Had great support. Uh, Sarah Nutter uh, helped me on the first phase of this project, uh, who's now the, the Dean of Business at uh, University of Oregon. She helped me bring all the community together for the vision part. And then Michelle Marks, who is now our Vice mm -hmm. President of Innovation and New Ventures, she helped on the, on the strategic plan formulation. Again, brought to the board, approved by the board. And that's what really gave me the marching orders. So uh, it was a luxury that not every new president has but not just I, we as a university had that moment to do that. And it was crucial for everything that happened afterwards. It was crucial to have that clarity. Yeah, and, it's, and so it seems that you had immediate support from your staff, high caliber staff people like Sarah and, and those folks. Did you have any other allies in the community early on that you, that you could um, have? And you probably had a few. Well, uh, I had to build that platform of support. Because remember, when, when you're an outsider, and in higher education, it's, it's not uncommon to, to, to bring someone from the outside universe. Now, you, basically, I'm, I'm like a Martian that has landed on planet Mason. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people give you the benefit of the doubt and assume, well, you know, if they've hired this guy, maybe, maybe he has something to offer. But they're also kicking the tires and not sure. So you really have to earn the confidence. You get the job. But the confidence, the trust, mm -hmm. the legitimacy to lead and to change things, you have to earn. The trust of individuals you have to earn. We had uh, a lot of turnover, natural turnover, but we had turnover in the senior team. Our uh, senior vice president at the time, Maury Sharon, Maury. left yeah. very soon after. Uh, his wife, who was our vice president of university life, mm -hmm. also also left. So there was... There was uh, Soon after that, I think our Vice President of uh, Diversity and Inclusion uh, also left. I mean, there was a whole number of people. The provost agreed to stay a couple of years, which was great. I, I love uh, Peter Stearns. I, I loved uh, uh, getting to work with him for two years. So he gave me some stability on that, on that side. But, but the rest of the senior team actually did evolve and change uh, during the first couple of years. 
and so I had to build those those connections through the faculty, and uh, and and it's very important, by the way, that for any president that you don't sort of isolate yourself, and uh, and that you you have to have uh, friends, connections, people who don't mind saying, Angel, you you need to be aware of this. Yeah, I, I recall your um, your first deans and directors meeting that I you invited me to to present. Uh, and uh, I remember meeting Dean, uh, the Dean of the Engineering Department, who literally said he had just been there like a week. <laughs> Absolutely. He, he yeah. was hired uh, at the same time I was. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was consulted during the process, but mm -hmm. we, we basically showed up at the first time. But, but that was also very important, uh, something that you did in those, some of those early meetings when we were trying to craft the, the mission. And I invited you a couple of times uh, to provide a presentation about the history of the university because I thought it was very, very important to ground the narrative about our future, to ground it on an understanding of our past and how we got here and to extract from that history what are the themes, what are the elements, what, are, what has made us the great university that we have become and build on those. So I really appreciate the, the, the several presentations that I asked you to do that first year. And that was that was an honor. So, what do you think was your first success as president of George Mason? Oh gosh, um, you know we we uh, well probably I mean the, the the at the very beginning I think building the team uh, and getting some new exciting new talent on our team that was crucial. Um, we also getting some of the big projects. I mean, I, I had to very quick learn the trade of lobbying in Richmond and develop yeah. relationships. So we had, um, I don't know that this is the main, but I mean, just to give you one of the early projects, uh, we had a construction project, uh, which is now the, the Peterson building, the Peterson mm -hmm. Hall, uh, who was uh, stuck, stuck because the Commonwealth had uh, promised uh, and had budgeted funding for 80% of the of the building and the school back in the day had uh, promised to to raise private money for for the balance and and the money wasn't there and we needed the building so sort of the the politics of how we could really get that project going and and and, um, and raise the money from the Peterson family who were absolutely wonderful and, and, and generous but also uh, getting a little bit more support from the Commonwealth. I mean, uh, that's one of the projects I remember, like specific projects. I'm not sure that's the earliest one or the, the most important one. But, but getting it back on track was obviously, because this was, you know, hearing about it, bef hearing about the concept that this would be a building that they could actually train people. You know, it's almost a medical building. Right. On right. this campus, right. which no one ever imagined. Right. Right. And and that would have been a big deal. Yeah, yeah. And getting it back on track would have been a yeah. big. It, it, it was, was a big. It deal. was a big deal. And now we have just a wonderful facility to enjoy that was built just in front of my office. To see it every day. Yeah. So, so you, a couple of minutes ago, you were just talking about the visioning process with the BOB, and it was it was a pretty comprehensive document, as I remember. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just okay. Here's our mission statement. It was. It defined what a what a what, you know what we want to be, what are what what type of students we want to turn out, um, and what we want to do for the future. Um, so the available data suggests that we're sticking to the plan, and uh, and it's working. So so what tangibles would you point to in order to define our progress so far? Oh gosh, there's there's so so much and. Um, so, for example, one of our, on the research side, uh, so th let me backtrack a little bit. The philosophy underlying our vision and then the strategic plan is this notion of access to excellence, this notion that we don't have to choose between being a, a, a top research university and a university that is inclusive and that tries to make room for more students, that we can do those two things at the same time, which sort of goes somewhat against the, the general convention in, in higher ed. And that vision and, and the idea of a university that is a, an engine uh, of innovation, 
uh, in a thriving community around us, a university that measures its success by the value that it provides to everybody that it serves, not by the accolades and the rankings. There's no mention to rankings on, 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 the, on the plan. It's all about the value that we provide. I mean, all those are, um, in a way, uh, specific manifestations of that broader vision of access to excellence. And, um, but that has translated into very concrete things. On the research side, we had a dream, and on the plan we said our dream is we want to be a Research One University mm -hmm. in the Carnegie classification. Because being a Research One is not just a, an acknowledgement that we're now performing at the level of the top universities in the country, but also opens doors for more resources, it, it makes it easier to attract new faculty and so on. Um, we achieved that in 2015. Mm -hmm. Uh, those, uh, the, 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 the numbers and the, the classification was redone in 2018 and we were reaffirmed. We're now a Research One University, uh, which is, again, not, not just a, a, a rah-rah, we're now a Research One, uh, but it has very specific implications. It makes it as easier when we are trying to compete to attract a, a physicist or an engineer or a computer scientist, because now they're joining a Research One University. On the access piece, we said we want to grow. Virginia needs more graduates. Virginia has a, a plan, and the Commonwealth told us that we want to be the most dedicated state. We need more graduates. But guess what? Over the last four, five, six years, Mason has accounted for 64% of all the growth in Virginia. So it's not just that we did our share. It's that we did more than half of the work for the entire Commonwealth. We also said that our growth has to be inclusive. Well, the number of minority students we serve has increased by 35%. We're now, for the first time, a minority majority school. We also said, by the way, we need to deliver value to our students. We need to improve graduation rates. We need to deliver more value to our students. Well, guess what? Our graduation rate has gone from like 64% to 70%. And this last year, we were admitted into the American Talent Initiative, which is a coalition of elite schools that graduate at very high levels. Virginia only had UVA, Virginia Tech, and William & Mary in that group. Now Mason has been invited to join that group. So these are, these are very specific examples. And by the way, they, they defy convention. You say, well, you cannot grow in diversity and perform better. Well, guess what? We did. You cannot grow in size and deliver right. better outcomes, what we did. You can all grow in size and do the research, what we did. And really what, what, is, what, what is happening at this university, and these are, by the way, I, 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 I relate these outcomes with great pride because I am really, really excited, not in the sense that, oh, these are, this is my scorecard. This is mm -hmm. our results. This is what we have achieved. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm delighted to have served as president during this period, but, but this is really, uh, an, an incredible story in higher ed, and, and a story that is not stopping here. I mean, I think the, the, the momentum of this university continues. And Dr. Merton used to say, every now and then there's a Mason moment mm -hmm. where we do something that we get recognized for, you know, and, 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 and during his tenure it was the Final Four or, you know, something else, you know, the, the Forbes magazine always putting us right up there mm -hmm. as the, you know, the next best thing and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, it's kind of the continuation of this Mason thing sure. where we, every now and then, we're on the radar. Well, I think, I think we're increasingly on the radar and people are paying attention. Part of my job, of course, is to go around the nation, is to tell the story of the university and people are paying attention because this is not, again, this is a very unique story in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in American higher ed. So, so George Mason and Fairfax, the city of Fairfax, have had a very special relationship for 60 years. And it was Mayor Wood 60 years ago that literally engineered a deal for us to be able to be here uh, in, a, in a really um, emergency Sunday afternoon session of the town council. Um, so what types of initiatives uh, has the university taken part in with Fairfax over the years to continue that bond to keep it, keep it together? Sure. Um, 
Well, first of all, uh, it was fascinating to, to learn uh, all that history and learn it from you, by the way, and, and it's been kind of fun to even participate in some events and lectures on the history of, uh, of this place. It's been just great. I love that part of the history of, of Mason, the fact that because it is too easy to take these institutions for granted. Mm -hmm. You know, for now students who show up here and say, oh, that's George Mason, it's always been there. No, George Mason wasn't here all along. And there was the effort of specific individuals, Mayor mm -hmm. Woods and the Till Hazels of the world and members of the business community that, that pushed hard and Governor Holton who signed the legislation and, and, and members of the General Assembly and governors who've done their part during the, I mean, it's, it's the work of individuals. And, and key in that story is the founding act of a blind mayor of a newly established city, small city in, in Northern Virginia, somehow um, working to establish the site here. What I've told, I think I have, you probably know this better, but I think I've worked now with maybe three mayors mm -hmm. in, in the last seven years. And my message to them has been consistent, which is you're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. We're bound to understand each other mm -hmm. and work with one another. And by the way, if the city does well, the university does well and vice versa. Mm -hmm. We're tied. This is the, the destiny of these uh, institutions or entities um, it will, will, will go together. So it's been fun to work with, uh, with the city to try to figure out how we, we've participated in design charrettes mm -hmm. uh, in the city, trying to invent the future of the city of Fairfax. We've invited the city to our own charrettes to envision the future of our, of our campus. And now we have a couple of very specific projects, one with the county and one with the city, that are going to expand residential opportunities for our students, which is uh, one of the pain points in the university. Now we're growing so fast, we don't have sufficient residential capacity. And financially, we don't have the liberty to borrow and, and build it. So these are two projects where the city is going to be opening in, uh, in partnership with private developers uh, really creating a residential facility in the city of Fairfax and the county right across the street near our West Campus. So these are two very tangible uh, manifestations of working side by side your your neighbors. You know what's really interesting, I was just thinking about this when you were talking about that latest, the latest idea with the housing. For as long as we've been here, Fairfax City se still seems like a small town. And it doesn't look like we have imposed any kind of sprawl upon it. We're still kind of the little college in the woods, <laughs> uh, albeit, you know. 38,000 students. <laughs> right, exactly, and, and, and over thousands. 100 buildings. Yeah, yeah. But still, it, it's still, I still, you still get that flavor of just that little college in the woods south of Fairfax. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, you know, you go to, for example, Charlottesville and the whole strip there, you know, it, it, you see nothing but, you know, places selling UVA paraphernalia and t-shirts yeah. and things like that. We're yeah. still just kind of tucked in, in here and, and we don't have, it, it, George Mason is not imposing. Right. That's the feeling. Yeah, I but, but I think, I think, I mean, there've been some nice gestures in the city and, and even imagery and stickers on the roads and banners yeah. and and the fact that many of the restaurants uh, accept uh, Mason, uh, money. The Mason money. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think, I think there are lots of symbolic uh, things that are happening that are bringing us close together. There are other things, other opportunities that we missed. I mean, for example, when this university drive was rezoned and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that was a totally missed opportunity, but it is what it is. And it was rezoned for uh, basically pretty high priced townhomes. Yeah. That could have been really, the connection between the city and, and, the, and the campus that could have been a sort of a vibrant um, commercial mm -hmm. section of the city with restaurants and stores and so forth. So they, they could have been a better thinking that would have really integrated and created that sense, more of a sense of, uh, of, of a college town. Mm -hmm. we, yeah. missed, we missed that chance. When I arrived and 
I, I met our mayor at the time and, and we talked about this and he said, you know, I agree that that's missed. And, and, missed and stuff like that gets thought of 20, 25 years prior. Right, exactly. You know, it's not like you can go back. <laughs> exactly. Every decision that you make in terms of zoning and urban planning, really the implications can be uh, for dozens of years, if not hundreds of years. Yeah, so, so Alan Merton used to jokingly call George Mason the best darn private school in the state system. <laughs> uh, you know, because of this perceived less than sufficient level of financial support from the Commonwealth relative, relative to our size. So do you think that's fair to say? Well, yes and no. So, so we, are, we are a public university, uh, and I always remind everybody, you've probably heard me say it many times, which is we have one shareholder only, and that is the Commonwealth of Virginia. And we have to keep that always, always in mind. Ultimately, whatever decision we make, is it serving the interest of the Commonwealth of Virginia? Now, it is true that on the operating side, the Commonwealth of Virginia, just like most states in the Union, have been declining in the level of support per student that they've provided the universities, and we're no exception to that. So that has forced Mason and many other universities to behave more and more in some aspects like private institutions would. For example, we do a lot of fundraising now, and we're very proud of, of the results that we have achieved in the last few years. but. But fundraising, which maybe even in the times of George Johnson may have been just a nice to have or a little bit icing on the cake to right. do certain additional things. As I say, it's no longer icing on the cake, it's cake. It's it's real, mm -hmm. it's a real part of, of our of our budget. Tuition, of course, has had to grow tremendously in all universities to make up for that lack of public investment. But having said that, by the way, Mason has kept our tuition for in-state in students significantly below the average four-year institution in the, in the Commonwealth. So, so yes, in some ways you have to be high, behave more as a private institution because you need to find resources elsewhere. But on the capital side, for example, and I think this is a fair thing to recognize the Commonwealth for, most of our growth has been funded by the state, by the Commonwealth of Virginia. So. The new building just across the street, the new, which is going to be the largest classroom building in a couple of years, hopefully it'll be on, on time, 100% funded by the Commonwealth. Peterson Hall uh, for Health Sciences, 80% funded by, by the Commonwealth. The Potomac Science Center, the, the, I mean, a lot of the growth that, that we've seen in, uh, in, in SciTech, I mean, a lot of that has been funded. So on the capital side, we benefit enormously from being supported by the Commonwealth. So have to be part of a, of a state that has a AAA credit rating that is financially very solid, which means that we can borrow at lower rates. So there are aspects in which being public, having myself been in the private sector is very nice to have the support of a, of a robust um, state system. Yeah, and I think most people don't realize that it costs one billion dollars a year to run George Mason. Yeah, now, this this year I think we're even now yeah. the budget for this year I think is now 1.2. I yeah. mean, yeah, yeah, we're it's a it's a pretty I mean, billion. I mean, yeah. 1.2 billion. It's a pretty darn big operation. Very complex. So which issues have represented major challenges for George Mason during your tenure? Well, some of the biggest headaches we've had um, have had sort of a, a political dimension, but I think it's very, very important that Mason continue to be an example of diversity, not just of people, but of ideas. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, ever since I arrived and, and throughout my seven years, we, it is, we, we tend to get you know, complaints or sometimes pretty aggressive complaints from both sides of the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. There may be a, an elected official who disagrees with something that one of our professors has, has written. Maybe a, an elected official or, or groups who disagree 
for example, that we decided to accept $30 million and agree to dedicate the law school uh, to the memory of uh, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. That, that created a lot of controversy. So sometimes we have been criticized from, from the left side of the political spectrum or from the right. And, and what's been very important in dealing with all those moments, uh, people sometimes are upset that, that the Charles Koch Foundation gives us money. They, they provide a lot of generous support. Many of our students, the, 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 the PhDs in economics, for example, the, the main source of funding is the Charles Koch Foundation. People don't realize that without that support, we would not have the world-class economics department that, that, that we have. Uh, but some people have trouble because they disagree with the ideas of uh, Charles Koch. And so that, that has been sort of a, a constant source of controversy and tension. But I, I think going forward, it's very important that Mason continues to be firm mm -hmm. about this idea that diversity is not just diversity of people and demographics, it's also diversity of ideas. And as the society and the world we live in becomes more and more polarized, People don't talk to one another. They demonize the other because they, they disagree with our ideas. You go and make friends in Facebook or, tw or Twitter with people who agree with you, or you watch the news that reaffirm your, your, news. Yeah. your view of the world. Mm -hmm. Honestly, universities are the last reducts, the last places where you can really bring all ideas and expose students to all ideas. Um, so, so we have to resist. We we have to resist those those pressures. Uh, in the case of of, uh, of the Scalia naming there, when when Justice Scalia died, and, and um, even President Obama at the time, mm -hmm. who ideologically could not be any more different, sure. President Obama praised Justice Scalia for having been one of the most influential jurists in uh, of our life and one of the most influential people in the legal system in the United States for, for a long, long time. So why wouldn't we accept that name in our law school? Is it just because some of us disagree with some of his opinions? Well, then what does that mean? Are we gonna have to have a sort of an ideological filter as to what kinds of ideas are okay inside of the university and what kinds of ideas are not? So we have to be very careful with that. And as much as that has been a source of headaches, I think it's also been an opportunity for Mason to show the type of place we are. And I hope we stick to, to that view of the world. Right, and I, and, and I think that this sort of thing probably happens at most big universities because you can't, you can't avoid this. And then also you can't be a right-leaning university or a left-leaning university and still be a, a, a public university. You That's can't right. just say, well, we only accept these right ideas or the or left. Those. Right, right. And, uh, but, but, you know, we, we, don't, we don't disinvite speakers at, at, at Mason. Yeah. And we have speakers and events from all sorts of directions. Under my watch, we have had prominent, a prominent Israeli Jewish woman be our commencement speaker a prominent Muslim, Iranian, American be a speaker. Mm -hmm. We've had people of all backgrounds bring in all sorts of ideas. By the way, we get occasional heat from some end or the other. It's okay. We just have to stand strong and say, no, we need to protect that diversity. I love it sometimes when I'm on walking across campus and, and you may have uh, students of a particular uh, interest or ideology and they're campaigning for whatever it is and a and, and hundred yards down on Wilkins Plaza there's a group mm -hmm. arguing or defending just the opposite it's like mm -hmm. love it this is this is exactly what what a university should represent yeah because people have to make up their own minds yeah so what initiatives events recognitions do you see as major achievements or, or landmarks for Mason over the past seven years? The biggest one without a doubt in my mind is the Research One mm -hmm. uh, recognition. That's a huge, huge milestone. I mean, they, they are only about 100 to 130 changes every time they do the numbers, but 
about 100 to 130 Research One universities. They represent really the most research intensive institutions in the country. The Ivy Leagues are in that group and the, and the MITs and the Stanfords and the flagship publics are in that, in that group. Mason is the youngest university in the country to be in that group. That, I mean, it's hard to exaggerate uh, how meaningful that is. And it says, uh, and this is, by the way, an achievement of, of our faculty and the staff supporting them and the graduate students support, supporting their work. This is our, our faculty every year competing in tougher uh, research grant uh, mm, yeah. processes and, 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 and bringing those resources in. But that is a huge, and again, as I mentioned earlier, is, is a huge accomplishment, not just because, oh, it's nice to, to be, now we are not one, it's because it opens new doors. It puts us in a different uh, playing level. Though it's, uh, it's also stressful, because now it's like, oh my gosh, we're sometimes, uh, I try to find metaphors in American sports, but I keep going back to European soccer, mm -hmm. uh, where I come from, but I, I always feel like Mason the moment we said, yeah, you're a research one, it's like, oh my gosh, it's like a, a second division team that is now playing in the Champions League and, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's stressful too. It's like, wow, our, we need to build infrastructure and more labs and more equipment. Now we're playing in the bigger leagues, but that's a challenge that is wonderful to have. And by the way, that I think is being addressed brilliantly by our team in the, now the, the research expenditures and awards are growing at an incredible pace. Uh, we're, we, we just earned a couple of years ago a center of excellence from the Department of Homeland Security. This is like a 40 million plus award, a very multidisciplinary exercise. All of those mm -hmm. can be traced back to the fact that we're now a research one. So I would put that really as one of our top, um, if you will, milestones that we have achieved. So do you have any amusing or sobering anecdotes from your time here at Mason that, that you would share with us? Well, there have been, uh, there have been many uh, amusing uh, situations and um, many of them, by the way, uh, just in the context of, of, of my own, my own uh, team. I, I just, I'm blessed with, with the team. I mean, we're, we've developed a great friendship and sense of uh, camaraderie. Probably the most shocking uh, moment that I remember was right during my first year. And it was, I think, um, I forgot what was the, I don't know if it was Mason Day, but I was invited to, uh, to give a speech and, um, about the university and, and whatnot. And as I was giving my speech, I'm interrupted by this and people start looking down the hill. It was right by the Mason Pond. They had brought the, um, you know, the, the big head presidents that, that, that run in the- in The nationals. The nationals, yeah. uh, which normally they run um, on, uh, during baseball games mm -hmm. and they race and there's, so they had brought them here and they were racing. Mm -hmm. And to my surprise behind them, they had an Angel Cabrera they big head you. <laughs> running behind them. And of course, they, I think they let my other me uh, win the race. And I was like floored. I was laughing so hard, like I could not believe they had done that. It was very, very weird. Was that the first time you'd seen that? Yeah. So I, you didn't know it was. I had, had no that. idea. They surprised me with it. It was very good. I remember seeing it. Do you know yeah. what happened to that? I have no idea. You don't where have it. it. Is. No, I, I don't. I don't know who has it. I don't know, but it's got to be somewhere. So, say fifty thousand foot view. How do you feel that? How do you feel GMU has changed over the last seven years? So, at heart, it remains the same place, um, but it is, it is, it is bigger. It is, it is. Um, better recognized I think it has better but but 
probably the most important, I mean, it has better recognition, as I said, it's now a Research One University. It has improved on virtually every dimension. Financially, it's better. Academically, it's stronger. Uh, it serves more students. We're more diverse. So all those things are, are real changes over the last seven years. Perhaps the one that may be less visible, and to me is more important, if I get it right, I mean, some people may have different views, but I really feel like there is a stronger sense of self-confidence about what this university represents. When, when I arrived, there was a little bit of, and we still have that chip on our shoulder and, and sort of like we have to work harder uh, to earn, and that's good and healthy. But, but there, there, there was a narrative about how well people don't recognize the type of university we are, even a, a sense that we needed to fight to be seen as a, as a traditional university and instead of embracing what's unique about Mason, right? It's almost like you have to do whatever UVA does or, or what Harvard does because that's what makes you be uh, a legitimate university as opposed to say, no, we don't have to be like that. At our game, at what we do, we're much better than them. I mean, 30% of our students qualify for Pell Grant. Mm -hmm. Only 10% at UVA, only 10% at William & Mary, 30% at Mason. And when you look at student loan default rates, we virtually have the same outcomes as UVA, William & Mary. Very few institutions can do that, can claim that, to serve a student population that is immensely diverse, that includes 30% of people with high financial need and that delivers outcomes that are comparable to flagship and elite private universities. So that sense of pride that we don't have to imitate, we don't have to do what others have done. We're, we're blessed to have a university like a flagship university like UVA in the Commonwealth. It's a wonderful place to have and they do a good job of what they do. We're different. Could you imagine, could you imagine the amount of first generation students at, at a UVA or William and Mary? Well, we have, we have uh, as you know, 40% of our students are first generation in their families to go to school. So all of that, what I, what I love is that, it's not that it wasn't before, but in a way, I think we're more and more proud of that, mm -hmm. as we should be. This is what makes this university exceptional and unique. So to your question that what has changed, my hope is, I hope I've, I'm reading this well, is that we are, we have a stronger sense of confidence of, of what makes this university exceptional. So what might, might we expect to see here at Mason in the future, short term, long term? Well, I, you know, I can't wait to see, I mean, first of all, there are a few construction projects that I'm, you know, I know that as, as I come back to, uh, uh, to Washington and Northern Virginia, I'm gonna be sneaking in and seeing, I, just, I can't wait to see the new classroom building here done, the expansion at SciTech. This is a very exciting project that we're about to get going, which was funded uh, by the, partially funded by the Commonwealth as part of Amazon's decision to come to our, uh, that's another, interesting story. So we are going to build a massive building, pretty large in Arlington, in the site of the original building, the old department mm -hmm. store. But it's more than a building. That's going to be one element of what's really a plan to develop a whole innovation district in Arlington. And it's a plan we're working with the county and we're working with private developers. So in a few years, the whole Boston to Clarendon corridor is going to look very different. It's going to be really a, an innovation neighborhood with Mason at its heart. That's going to happen in less than five years. Really, really exciting. SciTech is going to be different. There's going to be, um, I'm sure, finally a town center next to our campus mm -hmm. to really bring a lot more of a lifestyle and to, to, to that site. My prediction is that we may have a medical school at George <laughs> Mason, in, in which, which the more I have looked into the issue, I think we're ready. 
I think the region will benefit enormously from a, from a medical school. We have some of our faculty and people at the university right now looking into it. So if I'm trying to predict, I would say that in five years, mm -hmm. uh, George Mason will have established a, a medical school. It will probably be different and unique, and we'll, I don't know exactly how it will be oriented, but um, I'm pretty sure that will be also part of the university. We've done nursing for 45 years. So. Absolutely, <laughs> and, and, and uh, we're doing lots of pre-medical uh, programs and uh, at the graduate level we do a lot of biohealth uh, research as you know cancer research infectious disease we have tremendous uh, biology and, and, and biomedical innovation so that's an element that would benefit not just the university would benefit our region see for yeah 40 years ago people were saying well someday we'll have a law school that's right M maybe <laughs> and and it was fought uh, very hard by people in other parts of the state and now we have one of the best ranked uh, is a top 50, top 50 yeah. uh, law school in the country. So what challenges lie ahead? The, the, I mean funding is, is funding is one I mean we and uh, not only there's a general trend which is not great which is we, we have seen a, a national decline in public funding of our universities which I, I think it's a policy mistake but it's very hard to change because uh, no one wants to run on a platform of raising taxes and without any more tax revenue mm -hmm. is going to be hard to turn that around. So it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Closer to home in, uh, in Virginia, we're still underfunded compared to our peers. Mm -hmm. We receive about $3,000 less per student than UVA. Mm -hmm. And remember, we're serving a much a needier financially speaking student in the UVA, but we are like significantly underfunded compared to not just to UVA, Virginia Tech, William & Mary, VCU, all those schools are getting significantly more money per student than we do. We're growing so fast, much faster than appropriations can grow. So, so that's an issue. It's going to continue to be a, continue to be a challenge um, for the future of university. But I, I, I trust that that our elected officials are beginning to recognize that and recognize the value and may do something about it, but that will continue to be uh, a challenge. I think um, continuing, I mean, getting, I think there's a lag still, even though we, we're sort of closing that, but there's still a lag between what George Mason has become and how George Mason may be perceived by some people who are making pretty important decisions in our uh, General Assembly. So I think closing that gap and, and, and making sure that people in the rest of Virginia appreciate George Mason as an asset for the entire Commonwealth. Um, so th th there are some of those issues that need to be, that need to be, uh, we need to keep them in mind. So do you have any final thoughts about your time here at, uh, at George Mason? Wow, it's been uh, the honor of a lifetime to be president of George Mason. Um, I love this place, uh, and I love it in a in a pretty personal way. I think the the stories of many of our students, I, I see myself in them, even though you know we each have our own stories. But I've seen the power of higher education to change my own life. My parents didn't go to school, didn't go to college. Um, and, and I grew up in a, you know, blue collar neighborhood right outside of Madrid. What are the odds that, you know, a kid from that um, background one day would be uh, leading a, a major research university? It's all, and I'm the product of public universities, just like George Mason. You know, I went to public universities in Spain and then at uh, Georgia Tech, where I'm now, now heading, as, as you know. So, so the stories of our students are, are, in a way, my stories. And when I get to meet our faculty and staff, we all have those stories. So it's been a, really a, a, a privilege to be part of this community. I know I, these are not just words. I, I remain a Mason patriot for, for life. I'm now part of, part of the gang. I, I know I will be one way or the other. I, I'll, I'll find a way to, to remain connected to this. I'm, so incredibly excited about the future, so curious about, you know, who's going to be 
our next president mm -hmm. and 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 to see you know the the, the next wave of, of of things happening at mason i'm, I'm really going to be um part of this one one way or the other but but um maybe my my closing um message is one of appreciation and and, and heartfelt thanks to the entire community i mean we my family and i we've been just the support the just the the, the warmth the, the the support from everybody since we got here has been absolutely unbelievable I knew all along that I would have to leave at some point. I mean, unlike George Johnson and and uh, and Alan, who retired in the job, I knew I'm I'm much younger than they were, so there was no way I can you know I can retire in this job. So I, I knew at some point in time I would have to move on, mm -hmm. and I didn't think it was going to be this hard because <laughs> I really love what's what what is happening at uh, at Mason. So we're we're excited about the next steps, but. But it's uh, it's it's really big become a, a, a painful separation. I'm so grateful to everybody, to to the faculty, to the staff, uh, to the to the students. It's been just a really a, an absolutely wonderful chapter in our lives. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.